Again, I'm Tony Macklin. I have a dual background in community philanthropy at a large community foundation in Indianapolis for a dozen years, and then ran a multi-generational family foundation based in Pittsburgh for a few years, and have been doing consulting for donors and funders across the United States. And one of my ongoing clients is the National Center for Family Philanthropy, um, which we'll talk about one of the resources throughout this uh, session. And they had asked me to write a piece on risk in philanthropy and do a couple sessions for them three or four years ago. So some of what you're talking about today is based on that, and I'll help you dive a little bit more. Today's session is not going to deal directly with how to deal with the coronavirus and economy right now. Um, it's going to give you a chance to get some tools and ideas on how to step back and think about how your uh, family or your as a couple or as a foundation or other folks in a giving group think about risk differently and maybe sort of watching for windows of how they look at it and how you can talk about it better so that you can a think about your steps later on in this process as well as think longer term about risk and philanthropy and there are three resources that are linked in the chat box feel free to download those those are all free and uh, those are all great starting guides for you as you're trying to get some language around risk in philanthropy so th the first thing you probably well know is we human beings aren't always well hardwired for good decision making um, our brain makes up all kinds of untested stories hundreds of times a day because to the mind uncertainty equals danger and we are in especially uncertain and sometimes dangerous times for all of us and so it's even harder for us to make decisions together or feel comfortable in our decisions together when all of the other anxiety is happening in the world and in our families and in our communities and maybe in our neighbors. And so the anxiety exacerbates the tensions. Sometimes it might be underlying group decision making um, or might be underlying uh, or might raise tensions where you normally had unity around a cause and a family or a foundation or a giving circle or something. So if things feel unsettled and that unsettledness translates to your group process, whatever your group is, it's not a surprise. And so we'll talk a little bit about taming some of that in a couple minutes. Um, interestingly enough, I helped the National Center for Family Philanthropy just write their own quick brief on navigating this time of COVID and the downturn economy. And as we were chatting with that team in, in DC and across the country, they we came up with four ways to sort of manage yourself and, and risk in these uncertain times. And the speakers on the previous plenary covered a lot of these. So uh, hopefully we're all thinking in the good same lines. One is just watching for your own self-care so you're not stressing yourself out, turning off the news and all the rest of it. Um, and an encouragement to watch for mental health warning signs and others because this is a time where people who may be a little fragile will tip over the rest of the way. And there's some tools out there that you can go online and find to say like, you know, how do I watch for people who may be a bit more emotionally fragile and give them better support. Second is extending grace to different decision-making styles. We'll cover that in a second, but everybody has different risk tolerances naturally. They have different looks at how they look at leadership. They have different ways that they make decisions. Some people like making decisions quick. Some people take a lot of time. Some people need visual graphics. Some people need data. And they're all gonna sort of just go off of their initial sort of instincts because they're feeling a little anxious right now. So give people space and grace to deal with that. The third one, and Victoria touched on this a little bit earlier, is start with your philanthropic strengths. If you are tuning into the philanthropy news or the philanthropy social media um, or anything else out there, there is a scientific term would be a crap load of advice coming out for donors and funders on what to do in this time of crisis. And we covered a little bit of it in the plenary beforehand, but uh, there's nothing like starting with what you know already. So as Victoria and others said, starting with the grantees that you know and just getting in touch with them, starting with your philanthropic strengths. If your philanthropic strength is scientific research, then that's great. You should start with organizations that are scientific research oriented and go down that path at least to start off with. If you're used to grassroots advocacy, go down that path. Start with where you are for the conference. And then 
stretch yourselves and prepare for the long run. And we'll get to some audience questions here in a second, but stretch yourselves to figure out some different ways of giving beyond your comfort zone or your philanthropic strengths. And the panelists in the, in the plenary started been talking about that, finding more times to jump in quickly, finding more times to get into general operating support. So that's exactly sort of where we're all going on the same path on this. So I'm going to do this in two parts and I'm going to bring you all in a couple different places in these parts with a couple polls to see how you're thinking about things and also to open up the at least the chat box and question lines to see how you're thinking about some of these issues. I'm going to cover just a framework for looking at risk and philanthropy just so you have some general terminology. Then we'll dive into some of the mitigation and taming and we'll bring in you all to see what ideas you have on how you've been taming or dealing with risk and philanthropy. So we're gonna try polls for the first time in Zoom, or at least my first time. So I'm gonna have uh, David tee up the first poll and see how you're thinking about one of these four statements. So which of these statements might best describe you and your thought on risk and philanthropy? None of them are right or wrong answers, but go ahead and take a minute to dive in and say which one you think is most close to you. So most folks are comfortable with risk in the sense of funding something where results might be hard to measure, but they want some evidence that they're going to sort of see what's going on. That's a pretty common take in philanthropy, especially when you start getting into group philanthropy. Um, some people, you're going to have a small number of people who are pretty big risk takers and some people who are over on mitigation risk and in some communities and for some folks, it's all about, I want to avoid risk entirely. So. Um, you'll find all of those answers and your, your first uh, job back home is if you have a group that's making decisions, where else would those people answer on that and how far apart are you or how close together are you on that spectrum of risk and interest in risk. So one of the great philanthropic teachers, Bill Somerville, had this quote about a decade ago, philanthropy thrives on risk, it's a risk that fuels our grant making engines, pushes us uphill, leads us to new directions, and yet risk also terrifies most foundation executives and boards. And one of the things he got across and other folks who talk about risk get across is risk is neutral, ultimately. It's an evaluation or an assessment of a situation. We attach our own version of good and bad to that risk for the most part. There's certainly some things that are ethical or legal risks, but a lot of it's more about our assumptions and our emotions that are based on that. So. In, in risk and unpredictability, we start out loving it. When you're a baby, when you're a little child, you love surprises, peekaboo, anything else that sort of sort of excites you and brings in new information. Risk is awesome and fun is awesome. And you do stupid things when you're a kid and a teenager um, because risk is sort of still something that you're learning. But eventually, boards start looking like these guys and they look very... Uh, uh, baking out the element of surprise and very skeptical of bringing risk in. And there are a number of foundation boards that sort of get to this mode of, well, the more people we have, the more we think about risk needs to be sort of tamped out of philanthropy entirely. And we get away oftentimes from maybe the more entrepreneurial founding of a foundation or a donor advised fund. For those of you who are in formalized organizations, foundations, donor advised funds, Jewish federations, those kinds of things, um, there was a great document that came out of Grantmakers for Effective Organizations a few years ago, and they talked about what the source codes are of foundation culture, formalized culture, and each of these sort of has, brings in how we look at risk or maybe how we get more risk averse. So the first one is the banking culture and the fact that folks in foundations inherit the term like program officer and use the term due diligence, which in the outside world makes absolute no sense. But we just sort of drew this in from the financial world and due diligence is usually about like making something less risky for a lot of foundations or trying to answer every possible question of what can go right or wrong and sometimes doesn't leave a lot of room for creativity and innovation. Um, we also bring a lot of culture from the higher education and that means we tilt really hard on people who are experts um, and who believe in bureaucracy and structure. And that doesn't always lead for good risk uh, conversations or good innovation in, in philanthropy. Sometimes expertise can get in the way of thinking about way, things in new ways. 
And then the third place is we draw stuff from corporate culture, big corporate culture, more than um, small business, at least in, in the longer arc of organized philanthropy. It tends to be about metrics and control, again, at least in the old style MBA program, certainly at least as much as when I had business courses when I was in college. And so each of these was designed to sort of contain and mitigate risk more than talk about it more creatively. Um, so when we were wrestling with this at the National Center for Family Philanthropy, we talked to a bunch of philanthropic families and family foundations across the country and tried to ask them, how do you talk about risk and what do you even mean by a risk? If you pull a group of family members together or a foundation board together, you're saying, oh, this is going to be risky. Everybody's going to have different language on what that actually means and what they consider risk and even prioritize risk. And so I came up with this next graphic and you've got a version of this in the, in the links that were attached. Oops. That didn't go that way. Okay, so we'll start out. It's a five part piece of uh, risk. And I'll cover each of these in a, in a couple of different groups. So as you're thinking about your own organization, your own self, your family business, whatever you might be attached to, you may look at all these different perspectives of risk and see which of these may be stronger or more in tune with how you all think. Uh, the first piece that we look at are the internal risks. So it's the way that people individually look at risk, their personal risk styles, and then the organizational risk or the organizational, organizational culture. For personal risk, there's lots of things that we don't even realize are happening internally when we make decisions. This sort of, you hear about hidden biases or cognitive biases a lot. Um, these little sort of mental shortcuts that we make by accident, sometimes that are very helpful and sometimes that short circuit thinking about things in a good method methodical way. We have different decision styles we talked about before. Some people need a lot of information. Some people jump in quickly. We have different giving styles. Some people are really sort of, I want to respond by heart. And some people want to respond by head. Some people are thinking big picture about things. Some people want to hit direct service. And then for, especially for families and sometimes for smaller family foundations, a lot's tied up to reputation and identity. What we give to is an extension of who we are as people or our reputation or the legacy of a, a donor or family. All of those tie up into a personal risk style and it's never right or wrong. It just is who it is for a particular person. And so, um, in the links that you got sent, those documents give you some more language around these. And again, tool for you back home is looking at the people around you and yourself. Where do people differ in these decision-making styles and giving styles and their ability to sort of look at the reputation part of risk? And do you need to have a good conversation about what that means for your group or your family or foundation? All that lifts up then to the organizational culture around risk and what kind of governance is set up around it um, and what kind of reputation may be attached to the larger organization or the company or something. Oftentimes that's tone that's set from the top, the board and the CEO or the founder, even that can live on past the founder's generation. And so there's this legacy of, well, we always think about these things in this way, or we don't take time to learn, or we do take time to learn. Um, again, in the documents that are in the links, there's some good information about some questions to ask yourselves about how do we look at our organizational culture related to risk and innovation, and do we need to change some things around that? So those are the first things. It's just oftentimes the stuff that's hidden behind the scenes, it doesn't get talked about a lot. You'll find the links in the chat box. So open the little chat box in your Zoom uh, uh, tool and you'll see the links. The second piece of it, now these went a little wire, haywire, is uh, strategy and grant making risk. And this is where oftentimes donors or philanthropic organizations or foundations will start. And you could put the two of these together and call them impact risk if you want to. Um, strategy is sort of your own personal strategy style or your foundation strategy style, maybe fairly loose. We want to respond to stuff that's going on. You may have a very tight strategy around marching along the path of solving cancer or getting uh, grassroots people involved in racial justice, whatever the case may be. And so um, some of those things are based on your perspective and how you look at the time frame of that risk, the evidence that you need to make decisions, how adaptable you are in your strategy. 
and some of the rest of the things. And again, this may be a place where you need to start from your comfort zone, um, but then extend out as we get into crises like the one that we're in today. Um, you may not capture this very well. Sometimes it's written down, sometimes it's not. Um, another way to look at this is your investment policy statement. If you have an investment policy for your foundation or your donor advice fund or whatever, is an extension of this, like how do you frame risk and how you use your finances. And then you're looking at the individual day-to-day -day grants or investments you make along the way. And that's sort of where a lot of people then start with a risk conversation. And maybe where you need to start on risk conversation if you're working with other folks in a family or a donor advice fund or foundation. And so it's what do we mean by risk when we do due diligence on our organization? Is it about their talent? Is it about their financial stability? Is it about their organizational cultures or impact, whatever the case may be? And getting to better questions about what that means and is risk about compliance or not? Is it really once we give them the money, we're good with it? Is risk about evaluation? Do we work with them on the evaluation or not? Um, and then the last piece for both of these really is opportunity costs. Um, when I worked for the Family Foundation in Pittsburgh, one of the board members was really great about anytime there was a larger grant coming to them, he said, well, what are we missing by doing this? Is there another big opportunity that we should be thinking about? Or are we forgetting about something else in this? And so he was really sort of always trying to sound out the opportunity cost of what do we give up if we do something and he could be they'd be talked back out of it but at least he wanted to bring that up and so you might have somebody in your own group who's sort of the opportunity cost person um, mark baker in the plenary said there's actually another risk that sort of underlies these two and that's our risk on what are the people that are ultimately getting served by these organizations and the big risk would be that they keep having bad things happen to them or their lives decline in quality even though we're throwing money at something and so um the risk is is will something bad happen will nothing happen if we don't do anything the opportunity costs again or do we actually see some measurable results so oftentimes boards get caught up in well this is a risky grant because we don't know the outcomes well the opposite may be we something horrible would happen if we don't at least try something and so weighing that all out. So foundations tend to have a little bit better frameworks around these two things, but again, these resources in the, in the chat box will give you some more information. And then the last piece of it is the external risks. And these are external factors that um, business people would call externalities. So these are not preventable. It's not something you can sit down and strategize for and say, well, we can change the President's race, we can change the economy directly. We can't change uh, the course of a disaster necessarily, natural disaster like a hurricane. We can't control, control them directly. But what we can do is start, as uh, folks said in the plenary, doing some scenario planning and figure out how they might um, affect us. And we'll come back to that in the taming risk piece of it. Right now, we are swallowed up in these two external risks, the pandemic and the economic downturn likely turning into a recession and so this is sort of consuming our heads about oh my gosh we cannot control for these things and it creates extra anxiety for us in philanthropy and then it's hard for us to step back and look at all the rest of it so again some of this is for the longer term as you're looking at risk and some of this hopefully you can apply as you're thinking about some of your next donation rounds or grant rounds so that's the basic framework. We're going to get into taming in this in a minute. Let's get another poll out to you and just see sort of which of these is on top of your mind. So the next poll is of those five, which of these is sort of most challenging for your board or your family or whatever group you're working with right now? And there you go. Hey, look at that, how fancy that is. Um, so organizational risk, the sort of family brand, the governance and culture was the top result for you all. And it's hard because it's in the rush of working on things, having an organization, doing board meetings, family meetings, whatever you're doing, family business meetings. It's all about the agenda and the stuff you got to get done. And it's rarely about stepping back and thinking larger picture about things like risk and risk tolerance and the rest of it. Uh, no surprise strategy and grantees and the rest of it comes up pretty quickly. Okay, great, great. 
So we're going to dive into taming risk, and this is where I'm going to start bringing you all in to get a sense of how you all are thinking about taming uncertainty and taming risk in your philanthropy and see if we can pick up some tips from each other. And that's really what risk management or risk assessment or risk mitigation is. It's taming uncertainty. Again, back to the beginning, we are as human beings, pretty horrible about managing uncertainty and it sort of throws everything off internally for us emotionally and in our heads. Uh, and so we try to figure out how we can step back and tame that a little bit, bit and maybe even start thinking about how to take smart risk or even um, be more accepting of failure along the way. So uh, one more poll for you to see what you're tuned in on. So think about the last time your foundation or your family or your giving circle or whatever you have took a risk and something failed. Which of these answers most applies? For one philanthropic family that I was doing consulting for, it was number three. No matter what they did, they tried to learn from it, but then like two years later would like come back like a zombie and say, well, I remember two years ago when that thing failed, we're never doing that again. And they never quite sort of took the learning into what comes next. So hopefully it's not your family, but it can be. They learned and grew from it is the biggest answer. Well, kudos to you all. That is, probably, you are outliers on this group. The, the average group would be uh, farther up the chain in terms of not taking it or uh, not dealing with it well. So congratulations that you're learning and growing from the, the risk from the failures. I appreciate that. We'll look for your uh, tips and solutions as we dive into these steps. There we go. So, We'll, we'll bring you all in on these three pieces of it. And really sort of anybody who talks about risk management or risk assessment or taming uncertainty looks at some variation of these three steps. And um, not rocket science, but tried and tested and, and, and smart things to try out. And so you'll try to find ways that are, make sense for you to identify what the risk is and how you talk about it as an organization or as a person or family how you assess it and sort of rank it and prioritize it. And then how do you take care of mitigating it if you want to mitigate it or jump in farther into it if that's part of your strategy. Um, many of you are probably doing this right now in your philanthropy. Uh, I'm on a board of a food rescue organization in Pittsburgh and um, we are going through this every week as everything changes around us in terms of public policy food pantries closing, food resources closing, and more people being hungry because they're out of work. And so every week we're sort of going through this cycle quickly and informally to figure out um, both the staff and a board like, okay, what's coming next? How do we assess what we can do? And how do we sort of mitigate our own risk, the safety of volunteers and the safety of the staff, as well as deliver on our mission and mitigate not losing out on our mission in the long run. So tough times for everybody right now on this. So identifying risk, pretty simple tips, right? What's most likely to go wrong? And that can be a variety of exercises. One of the things that I learned from another foundation um, and then came out of the business world, I guess, is something called a pre-mortem. A lot of you have probably heard of post-mortems where something happened and you go debate about it and talk about it in, in a room somewhere. The suggestion of a pre-mortem is, is fairly simple and actually pretty fun. And so you take something that you're working on, say you've got a, I don't know, a three-year grant to an organization. And the question is, what would happen if this uh, failed spectacularly? use that phrase, if it failed spectacularly, get a bunch of people in the room who have different perspectives, have them write down like, huh, here's how, how I think that would happen and why did it happen? So first you assume it fails, second, what's their reason of why? Talk about all of those and then start working your way backwards to figure out, okay, how would we deal with that if it did actually happen? And you can do that with something simple, you can do it with something complex. And so it's kind of, version of scenario planning or this pre-mortem planning can be really useful and it does help in all of these identification tools to have different perspectives. So if you're the grant making person or you're the program person or you're the lead person to get money out the door, get somebody from the board, get somebody from finance, get somebody from communications, you know, all across the board to sort of bring different perspectives into these kind of things. Um, the opportunity cost thing we talked about before. So ask the question, what are the risks if we do nothing? And that's another great exercise because a lot of stuff can go right. Sometimes you need to get out of the way and sometimes you need to get in the way faster than you are. 
Um, and then sometimes you just need to create space and time for reflection. And even in our best selves and in the best circumstances outside of these kind of giant things we're feeling right now, we often don't take enough time to step back and reflect. And all of the best literature on psychology of how we make decisions and how we look at things in the world says we need time to process. We do it when we're sleeping, we do it when we're staring out the window, when we're playing music, anything but actually working on the problem. And sometimes we don't give enough time for that. So as you're coming out of the current crisis or at least the initial reactions to it, where are you gonna take some time to create space and reflection and for everybody else that's involved in your philanthropy and then bring that in one of the tools not on this is for people who know this tool is um, human-centered design, uh, which is a great way to uh, methodology to get um, clients or the end users involved in envisioning what comes next for them, social service, homeless service, housing, whatever the case may be. Um, a, it's very creative. It's sort of very um, hands-on creative. B, it gets their voices in the mix and see it brings their perspectives in alongside yours or the CEO of a nonprofit or, or somebody else. And we're seeing more and more foundations and donor advised funds start using some version of either human-centered design tools to get people creatively involved in problem solving that affects their own lives, or they're going directly to listen to clients of organizations sort of bypassing the nonprofits themselves. And so sort of the encouraging next step for you once you get out of this initial crisis is, are you sort of going farther out and listening to people that are most affected by a problem and involving them in the problem solving? Let's stop with the identification piece and see that folks have things that they want to offer. What are you, what tools are you using to identify risk in your philanthropy or what questions do you have about identifying risk? Had we been doing this live, I had exercises for you to work on as a group in this, but a little hard to do it over virtual. So unfortunately, we don't have those group exercises for this version of it. But if you've got questions, plug them away as, you, as we come along on this. this, is giving you some frameworks, obviously. Um, so first step is identifying risk. Try to get a sense of what that looks like. And again, everybody's going to bring different perspectives on it. We saw from that five-piece graphic earlier. Second piece is taming risk. So is assessing it. Um, and there are sort of two steps to this. One is what people would call categorizing the risks. So is it preventable? That is, you can't prevent COVID from starting, but maybe you can prevent it from spreading. Can't prevent a hurricane. You can prevent some of the, you know, sort of the corollary damage that happens afterwards. Is it a strategic risk? So for some foundations and some donors, they take a strategic risk because they want to take a chance on something. And so we can, oh, we need to find a new way to cure disease or something. And so it's part of our larger strategy to make a sense of it. So that's something you want to do. Or is it something that's unavoidable? It's sort of an external kind of thing, like a hurricane or something. Um, a uh, question from the last two resources, you need to be a member of NCFP. They should be free to everybody. Um, if those links are not free to everybody, we'll be posting these resources up on the website, right, David? Uh, so, yes, absolutely. Yeah. So there are also PDFs that we'll post up. You should be able to get to those free. If not, we'll figure out a way to get them out to you. So anyway, you've got a risk. You've done some identification of it try to do some categorizing to see if it's preventable or strategic. If it's preventable or strategic, you keep moving forward on it. If it's unavoidable, then it's something that we'll deal with in a second phase here. The second piece of it then is, whoops, I'm gonna go back. The second part then is, if you've got it and it's preventable or strategic, what's the severity or probability? And you can do like sort of a two by two matrix or a three by three matrix if you wanna do that and say, okay, uh, on one side of it, severity is from low to high. On the other, on the horizontal is from low to high on probability. And these are not scientific unless you're a statistician or a, a, uh, uh, have some actuarial skills for the most part. But again, it's, a, it's more about the group exercise and where do people think about the actual risk. So, okay, we're going to make a new kind of investment in affordable housing. Is that something that's uh, the thing that's going to go wrong with that, how far off would it take us off path on that? How severe would that be? Or how probable is something like that happening? And again, just even everybody sort of 
placing dots on that matrix, two by two matrix or three by three matrix, however you draw it, um, is a good exercise to figure out how are people thinking about that. So good exercise to take back to your board or your family is just try that out a couple of times and see where people are thinking about risk and risk tolerance. Um, so we'll stop here again. Um, for all of you who are on the, on the webinar, do you have tips on how you assess risk in your own foundation or philanthropy? Are there certain tools you're using to diagnose, yes, is something's high or low risk? I know for a community foundation that I had done some work with a couple of years ago, they went through some of these basic exercises to try to get better at talking about risk. They were trying to get, mm, as their term was, more upstream on problems and not just sort of due to the sort of basics of them that try to think about policy. And so they started doing their own little risk matrix and the materials that they delivered to their board. So in addition to the normal, hey, this is a $10,000 grant and it's gonna help 50 homeless people and it's this organization that we trust really well, here's sort of our initial risk diagnostic and then use that as a tool for the board to talk about risk. And it helped them really surface the different risk perspectives from the board members and it helped them tune their philanthropic strategy some. So they realized that the board was far more, weirdly enough, worried about sort of reputation risk for the foundation if something went wrong and less worried about the strategic risk or grant by grant risk. And so they found out that they actually had more leverage to sort of work on the strategy end of it. They just had to make sure that the board was fully aware and knew what would happen if things went right or wrong. And so it was more about the forewarning than it was the actual something that happened later on. So good for them to test that out. It gave them a better chance to sort of work with their board members along the way. What's the highest percentage do you recommend come from a single foundation? I'm assuming this is from Michelle, I'm assuming that means um, support for a single organization. Um, and then we'll get to Robert's thing. So Michelle, I think that's a great question for the group. At the end of the day, most philanthropists, but not all, are worried about organizations um, getting too dependent on their giving on any kind of level. And so, most foundations, if they're more formalized, I've seen will try to cap things at like 25 or 33% or something, especially higher for small organizations or new efforts. Um, oftentimes you'll come in at a full amount for a new effort or a small organization and then sort of ramp it down over time. But there are some donors who love having their fingers in an organization. And the family foundation I worked for, for instance, uh, the family members had discretionary grants where each of the family members could go and do something separate in their hometowns. And a couple of the family members were happy to fund a small arts organization at a very high amount every year, even 50% of the budget, because there was nobody else in that little town that could bring that kind of money to bear. And so they, they felt comfortable keeping the organization alive on their own. And that's sort of their, that was their philanthropic comfort zone, but not the typical answer for most folks. So maybe other folks can weigh in on Michelle's question of what's the highest percentage you'd uh, be comfortable with um, for an organization or a project from a single foundation. Robert asked in the chat box, he says, we don't think about grants in these terms. We try to learn enough to see if we believe in the organization. And if it fits our purpose, we do it. Robert, that is awesome. And we're gonna come back to that kind of thinking toward the end of this webinar. And you heard from that already. Um, on the plenary today, this idea that we step up and do more general operating support, or as the term of art is called now, trust-based philanthropy. Um, so we'll come back to that, and kudos and cheers to you on that one. That's a, a great way, and interestingly enough, a lot of people will say it's risk, less risk if I just give them the money and let them figure things out. So the last step in this, and we'll ask again to see if you'll have some ideas, is then the mitigation piece. This is where oftentimes a risk uh, averse board member or family member or donor will start like, oh, how do we pound risk out of this kind of thing? 
if we want to do that. And there's pretty typical ways of doing that. First is pilot projects, which lots of donors and foundations do. Um, the term of art from the business world or entrepreneurship world over the past uh, 10 or 15 years is Little Bets. There's this amazing book called Little Bets that take you through how do you really think smarter about doing a pilot on something and quickly learning from it and failing and then redoing it again in more intelligent ways. Lots of foundations and donors, when they're uh, time strapped or staff strapped, will do it through collaboration and intermediaries. And we mentioned that at the, the folks mentioned that in the plenary today. You know, if you don't have time to do your own research, you've got a local Jewish Federation or Community Foundation or giving collaborative that's already doing the work for you. Um, and oftentimes, collaboration means that different people will pool money at sort of different levels of risk. And, I was involved in a funder collaboration that was dealing with creating a new homeless intermediary in Indianapolis, Indiana. And it was interesting as we went around the table, some foundations like wanted to only come in on the safe side of it. And so they funded sort of the direct service piece and other foundations did some of the stuff that was more research and policy oriented because it was a bit riskier to try to figure out what would go on with that. And so we were all on our own trying to figure out how we divide up the money based on the risk of that particular effort. Some of it may be doing deeper grantee relationships, just like uh, Robert mentioned in the, in the chat box there. And the more you get to know an organization, the more you have honest conversations with them, the less likely you feel like they're a risky bet um, or that you really understand the risk well and you feel more comfortable about taking them alongside the organization. Those first three things, the pilot projects, the collaborations, the grantee relationships, work really well for what we categorized before as preventable risks, the sort of things, okay, well, they didn't think through that well enough, so we just need to work on that a little bit, or the strategic risk, I know I want to take a deep dive or take a risk on something. The, the last piece, the contingency and scenario planning, is something that applies to those both those initial preventable or strategic risks, but also to the external ones. So this is where uh, Andres, I think, said on the in the plenary that the JFN is starting to think about scenario planning uh, for what happens when these kind of big emergencies or big crises happen. And certainly, businesses are trying to do scenario planning about what happens with the with the economic downturn. The resources that are in the chat box. Um, a couple of them have some links to scenario planning tools, or you can Google nonprofit scenario planning, and there are a couple of great free tools out there um, that help guide you through scenario planning processes. You can make it fairly simple and quick um, to help you think ahead on things and figure out how you would react to them, or you can get more complex about it if you like that kind of complexity. Um, so another time for you all to weigh in. What kinds of ways are you mitigating risk? Or, risk risk or how are you trying to get better at thinking about it um from fiss fisaa i do infrastructure grant making as a primary goal i want them to have what they need not to capacity build this may be a mitigating risk but it's on their thought night mine as i see it you're right you're right infrastructure is a great way to sort of look at the bigger picture on things and that builds a larger field about it um, and then they can figure out what the risks are all of you that you don't have to get into the sort of weeds with them on it. So that's great. That's a good way to look at it. Similar version to collaboration and intermediaries in some ways. How are other folks thinking about mitigating risk with your philanthropy? Or how many of you are saying, heck with it, I'm going to be really risky. Uh, Alex Greenbaum says providing a larger number of smaller grants rather than focusing on one or two organizations. Yep, some people spread risk, uh, much like some people do in their investment portfolios. Lots of different companies with lots of different uh, sort of stages and the rest of it, and you can do very much the same thing with your grants portfolio. Um, uh, as a friend and philanthropy told me once, the down, there's a downside risk to spreading your money across a bunch of organizations, which is maybe none of them are doing all that much with the money. And so you have an opportunity risk of not making a deeper impact in a particular community or location or, or geography or issue or something. And so you sort of go back and forth on that as philanthropists. But yes, yes, definitely. That's something. Uh, Laura says, in an emergency, I'm less risk averse and less strategic. I just want to help. And that's perfectly fine. We said that earlier on. 
sometimes you change your strategy quickly when you're in an emergency or when there's a crisis and you bypass all the normal stuff that you might think about and just dive in. Um, and some families hold true. Um, there are, if you look at the Center for Disaster Philanthropies kind of uh, advice to all of us, mostly de dealing with things like hurricanes or something, um, there are some families that, and donors will jump in and just help right now in these sort of immediate two, three months of whatever's going on. Uh, but there's still plenty of recovery and resilience work that has to happen after that. And there are some foundations and families that have gotten good at saying, you know what, I know there's going to be a bunch of cash pouring at the middle or at the beginning, I'm going to wait to the middle and then sort of see what needs to come next and I'll dive in there. And so they hold true to their risk tolerance profile to say it's okay for me to wait and sort of think more strategically later on or they might do, might do both. But yeah, for some people it is just jump right in. Maybe so the, in the, Links in the chat box, there's the document from Open Road um, Alliance, which has also been one of the pioneers at documenting how to talk about risk in the field. And they worked with some other foundations and nonprofits to re, uh, look at the toolkit that you can download for free. They have some great questions in there that you can use to test out trying to talk about risk with grantees, whether you trust them a lot, you just wanna get a better conversation going, or if you wanna embed it in more of a, application form or report form. So take a look at that. They got some, some good questions to ask your grantees along the way. Well, thanks for sharing what you all are doing. It's all sort of, a lot of it's just, you sort of know it by gut and part of the encouragement of this session and the documents that you have is to at some point step back and get better language around it and get some better practices around it because oftentimes risk can be sort of squishy and um, we don't talk about it well and it serves you in the long run to do to to talk about it well. So here's some other advice from your peers. Again, folks that I talked to when I was working on one of these pieces and, and also another session. Um, before we jump into that, Paula says, the basis of delivering effective differentiated education uses a similar model, assess, analyze data, set goals, create and implement, start the cycle all over again. Yes, yes, exactly. That's very much the same kind of thing as good design or good little bets, you know, create a hypothesis, test it, learn from it, iterate or change and go back through the process again. Um, this, oh, Arnie, sorry. Um, and it's something that we learned in scientific method at whatever grade you learn scientific method and then we sort of cast aside and it becomes actually very useful. And sometimes in these kinds of emergency situations or crisis situations, it's giving your grantees the space and the tools to do that kind of quick iteration and learning from it and giving them the ability to sort of try and fail and try and fail as they adjust or to do scenario planning like JFN will be doing soon. So these are all pretty self-evident, but know yourself and watch for your cognitive device biases. The organizations I talked to who are good at risk said they always started with themselves to make sure they were checking their own risk tolerances and questioning themselves. Somebody said, um, I have an accountability buddy. And so if I'm like, confused or I'm caught up in something or I'm feeling like I'm not thinking about it well, I call my friend and they ask me really challenging questions and get me out of my headspace. And all of us probably can use an accountability at this buddy at this point as we're thinking things through. Um, define your organizational take on risk, not now probably, but later on as you get out of sort of the emergency piece of it, the kind of having it as part of your strategic planning process, as part of a board retreat, as part of a staff meeting to test out people's risk tolerances create an action plan about how you're gonna look at risk and mitigate it. Some people will just start it with uh, maybe one program area or one type of grant or one small set of grantees they trust well and sort of test the methodologies and then use that to test some culture shifts and practice shifts. As an example, the family foundation that I was with again, um, they had some program areas that were around for many years. They were created by the baby boomer generation and they were terrific people, but they were sort of like, this is what we're gonna do. We're in a lane and they didn't wanna vary from that lane too much. But there's a younger set of family members, next generation millennials that wanted to do something too, but couldn't break into those program areas. And so we created a new culture and practice of some more mobile task forces. And we did a philanthropic survey of all of the donors or all the family members and said, well, what are you interested in? And what kinds of things are sort of itching you to get involved? 
Um, and we found some new ways where family members across branches and generations were interested in things that weren't on our agenda already. Um, and so our culture shift was creating sort of more mobile intergenerational task forces. And they got to reset the culture of how they looked at things. The committees stayed the way they were, the three standing ones, but the new task forces got to be more innovative, more creative, more nimble about how they were gonna tackle products. And then hopefully that may have affected the rest of the organization. I had to leave after a couple of years when my wife and I moved, um, but hopefully that changed, did some practice shifts. Uh, Melissa says, uh, have a shorter time frame for reporting requirements so you can take, take, stay on top of potential problems. I can't talk. Um, that's great, Melissa, and some other folks will um, do a variation on that and just do a quick phone call so it's not even a, a formal report. Just, hey, if it's a six-month grant, I want to just do a quick check-in with you on the phone because you can get so much more out of a conversation or a quick site visit or something. So, yeah sort of get involved sooner than rather than waiting for the later. Anonymous attendee asks, will you be sharing the PowerPoint? I sent the PDF to JFN, and so they can add that to the website along with the other PDFs that we've shared through links, yes. Yes, or you can, my uh, email will be at the end. You can email me too if you don't get it um, sooner than you need it. Um, Test more risk aware grant making. One of my favorite stories on this is a um, family foundation that's in Pittsburgh, not the one that I was with. Um, the person who founded the foundation was 90 a few years ago um, and got fed up that the foundation wasn't taking enough risk. He had really smart staff and they were doing really great grant making, but he felt like they weren't failing enough. And so he walked in one day to the CEO and said, we need to start taking more risks. Let's set up an innovation fund and try it out. And so even old dogs can learn new tricks, I guess. And so they were one of the first foundations, the Hillman Foundations in, in Pittsburgh to set up a discrete innovation fund. And they've really been at the forefront of technology solutions for public issues and some of the rest of it. You can look up the Hillman Foundations in Pittsburgh and read a little bit more about their innovation funds. Um, one other thing here, and we'll pop to the last couple slides, contingency budgets. Um, again, the Open Road Alliance that I mentioned earlier has been one of the great pioneers in setting up contingency budgets. And so they look ahead and say, okay, well, we're going to spend whatever their grant making budget is, $500,000 next year, but we're going to set aside 50000 of that or put an extra 50000 on top for contingency because we know that grantees are going to run into stuff that they can't predict. They do a lot of international work. And so there are things like there's a regime change. A flood takes out the only bridge that gets to a village. Um, something breaks down in the supply chain to get drugs down to the local level. All this stuff that happens that you can do your best to think about, but you don't know when it's going to happen. And most of these international aid organizations, the small ones that they work with, or maybe lots of small grantees you have, don't have reserves set aside to sort of pick up quickly when something like that goes wrong. And so for the Open Road Alliance, those organizations can call them and say, I've run into this thing, we're doing our best to deal with it, and can we get some extra money? And they turn around a grant in like, I don't know, a couple of weeks or something, and there's an extra 5000 or $10,000 to deal with that contingency. So a great way for you to be friendly to nonprofits and certainly very true right now in the current crises. And the last couple of things you all touched on already a little bit, which is adaptive philanthropy and intelligent failure. So there's this, uh, the, the term before was uh, uh, adaptive philanthropy that came out of bridge span. The more current term is trust-based philanthropy. You see the graphic on the screen and you can see the link on the bottom. You can go to trust-based philanthropy. And by gosh, those practices are the same ones that lots of people are saying we should be working on right now during this current uh, twin crisis of pandemic and economy. So more unrestricted funding, do more homework to get to know the organizations well, be more transparent, responsive, all the things you've heard more than once today and probably more than once from JFN and some of the rest of your peers around that. Um, the people who pioneered this work were giving that same advice six or seven years ago, calling it adaptive philanthropy and possibility-based philanthropy. So it all keeps coming back around, but again, in times of trouble, and even in good times, a lot of people say it's far less risky for me if I just get to know these organizations well, give them the money they need, and if they are well-funded, they'll be able to answer risk on their own and deal with risk on their own rather than waiting for contingency money. The other piece to take away, and um, 
is this idea of supporting intelligent failure and the uh, Arnie uh, mentioned earlier in the chat box, this cycle of assess, analyze, set goals, create and implement a plan, start the cycle over again. There's variations on that. So there's a whole body of work out there of intelligent failure. And so sometimes people just say, I don't want to be risk, I don't want to fail. And the answer is, I just don't want to fail stupid or I don't want to risk stupid, or however they might phrase it. And so a lot of times you can accommodate people who seem risk averse just by walking through something like this and feeling like you've been able to answer all the questions and understand the process. And then they feel com more comfortable. They just, they're scared of the unknown, right? They're scared of the uncertainty about what would happen if something goes wrong. And so develop your experiment or your prototype, or your pilot, make sure you are very clear about what you want to learn assign a no blame review, which is a very important about it, to come back and say, you know what, that didn't work, let's figure it out. Doctors are great at this at hospitals when they do hospital rounds or medical rounds, they all come together and say, okay, that didn't work, let's have, how do we fix the system and how do the nurses change this and sort of work our way through it as quickly as possible. Revise all your ideas and go back around. Lots of nonprofits I have observed, and this may be different from your experience, will come in and say that they want a pilot grant or like a, a grant to try something out. And they'll usually have a really great idea, but the rest of the process tends to fall apart for them yeah, because they may not have the skill sets or the internal culture or the toolkits to work on the rest of it. And so you as a foundation or as a donor might push them a little bit or in, be in a longer conversation with them and say, well, okay, if you're gonna have that pilot or we're gonna try something new, tell me a little bit more about it. What is it exactly you're testing about? Is that testing question clear enough? Um, how was your process of them coming back and learning and understanding that? And back to what we talked about before, are you gonna learn about that with the people you're serving or your clients or your constituents, whatever you call them, customers, get all their feedback into it and then come back and revise. And we'd love to chat with you as you revise that and then see if we need to do another cycle. And so you have to develop your own skill sets and muscles around these kind of things and your grantees or social enterprises or other folks you work with may need to build their skill sets. Stop there for a second. Anybody else using these tools, these trust-based philanthropy tools or supporting intelligent failure? Wait, did I It's actually you? Arnie. I, I don't know why it has my assistant. Oh, that's okay. Hi, Arnie. Yeah. Now, I, I think in education, there's a lot of focus now. Uh, not, not, I'm not talking as much from experience in terms of philanthropy, but there's a lot of focus on, on kind of um, no blame on what doesn't work. And if you don't take risk, you, you don't, and you don't fail. And if we don't role model that for our children, um, then, then they, they don't also take risk and you don't really learn. And so this is really a model of learning. Um, so. that's, that's fantastic. As you've been observing this, if you can come back on the line there for a second, like sort of what's a typical time for going through that model that you put in the, in the chat box? Is it like a three month process, six month process? Um, well, we actually uh, promote it for teachers to go through it on an ongoing basis. Oh, ah, yeah. That it's, it's kind of the process they're doing at some level day to day. And, and at other levels, you, there's certain things you do on an annual basis, certain things you do maybe on you know quarterly basis, but um, using different assessment tools they, the focus on trying to differentiate and individualize learning and help all learners, at which we all fall into this, is, is really something in which uh, that process is an ongoing process. And to the degree you, you develop the practice of, of that cycle, um, when you are in the role of teacher, um, that you're more effective. Um, and to the degree that you help a learner develop that for themselves, they're more effective at learning. 
No, that's perfect. And, and that's also a great lesson, right, for other folks who might be involved in your group philanthropy, other family members or a board or other staff members. Everybody's got sort of a different learning style as they're trying to absorb all this kind of information or try to absorb what's going on with risk. And so sometimes you may have to think as a staff member or a family member, like what's their individual learning style and how do I help them move along these paths? Right. Excellent. Thank you for sharing. Thanks for giving this session. Anybody else using a trust-based philanthropy or, or sort of trust the organization and just give them the money kind of grant making? Well, I appreciate you all taking the time today. This is meant to help you think a little bit now and a lot more as you dive into the next stages of your own phil philanthropic journeys and your organization's philanthropic journeys. And as you think about once we get hopefully uh, sometime soon out of the initial rush of responding to these uh, twin crises, how do we start thinking about the, the risk and responses in the, in the longer term or midterm? Um, so hopefully you get a chance back to take a pause, step back, breathe, before you get too far away from this webinar and back into the, the day of everything else, you might sketch out for yourself. You'll get these materials and the, the PowerPoint here up on the website, hopefully soon, or email me. Um, like, what do you want to try in the next six months? Do you want to have a conversation philosophically with the board or with the family or whoever else about what do we mean by risk and maybe use the five part graphic to have people start circling where they're interested for future conversations. Do you want to dive in and try it as part of one of your grant making strategies. Do you want to um, Find some ways to take some little innovative solutions and little bets or, or adaptive philanthropy and try those some um, Give yourself a little bit of a goal along with responding to the crisis in the, in the short term. How do you want to embed smarter risk or intelligent failure into your organization along the way? Um, as I've been mentioning along the way, these same websites we put up in the, or uh, two of them we put up into the chat box and we'll get some materials out to you or, um, through the website or other means. I'll, I'll let David describe that. Um, but the taking risks and learning from mistakes on NCFP, that should all be free materials. There's a webinar that is probably behind the paywall, but the PDF and other tools should be free to everybody. Open Road Alliance has a bunch of good information on risk and philanthropy in terms, in terms of a couple studies, as well as the toolkits and everything else, some sort of tear sheets you can use for a quick conversation. And then if you don't know already, the Case Foundation, Steve and Jean Case, the great technology pioneers, um, have this whole movement called Be Fearless. They're around for six, seven years, maybe five years. Um, and there are five points to their fe uh, Be Fearless agenda that helps you think about um, innovation and risk and even failure in your philanthropy or in your organization and gives you some, again, good language to talk about when you want to jump in and, and be more innovative and risk friendly in an organization. And everybody always appreciates the clarity of their communications in that work. Here's my uh, email. So feel free to pop me a note if you want any of these materials soon, or if you have a question offline from all of this, I'm happy to provide other examples of how other funders or families have dealt with some of these issues. I've got a bunch of other things saved on some of these risk issues. If you want more information on organizational risk or due diligence risk or all the rest of it, I'm happy to recommend a couple other things to read on top of your, I'm sure, enormous stacks of things to read already.